History of Egypt by F. C. H. Wendell Chapter 9 The Egyptian Renaissance Dynasty 26 645 through 525 B.C. Section 1 Semtek the First, six forty five through six ten BC. We have seen in the preceding chapter how the house of Sais gradually rose in importance. The first Ati, as the Egyptians called the petty sovereigns of the preceding epoch, of this line that succeeded in gaining supreme power even though for a short time only, was Tefnacht, the contemporary of Usarken III, king of Bubastis, and the great opponent of Pianchi. How his attempt at unifying Egypt failed, we have already seen. A descendant of his was the Beken Renf, who ruled at least in Lower Egypt for six years. 734 through 728 B.C. The next prince we know is Nekau, the favorite of Asarhaddon and Asur Banipal. As predecessors of this Nekau, Manetho mentions Stephanites, ruled seven years, and Nechepsos, ruled six years. The Egyptian names of which princes are unknown. This Nekau seems to have come to his death about the time Tanuat Amon invaded Egypt, 664 B.C. Nekau was succeeded by his son Samtek, the Samatikos of the Greeks, who was given the name of Nabu. Ushesib Ani, at Asurbanipal's request. Semtek seems to have been a faithful ally of Assyria for quite some while, but he merely waited a chance to gain his independence. He entered into friendly relations with Tanuat Amon, marrying one of his relatives, the Ethiopian princess Shep en Apet a daughter of Queen Amonardas. As Amonardas had been queen of Egypt, Semtek thus acquired a claim to the throne. At length, the right moment came, about 645 B.C., aided by mercenaries sent him by King Gyges of Lydia. He succeeded in making himself independent from Assyria. It is evident that he succeeded in this only after a struggle, but we have no record of his combats with Assyria. His next enemies were in Egypt itself, though he was undoubtedly the rightful sovereign of the country, yet the many petty rulers that divided the country among themselves did not submit without a struggle. Samtek, however, succeeded in gaining the ascendancy and uniting Egypt under his scepter. Semtek made Sais his capital. This made Neit, the great goddess of Sais, the official head of the national pantheon, and deposed Amon-Ra, who had held this position, with some interruptions, for about fifteen hundred years. Memphis, the oldest capital of Egypt and part of Semtek's original principality, was also highly favored, and many of the government offices were located there. Thebes was falling into decay. The Assyrian wars had dealt the city a blow from which it never recovered. True, Semtek and some of his successors built here, and repaired the great temple of Amon, but the city never again rose into prominence. 
of the city of Sais there remains today scarce a trace. The climate and soil of the delta are not favorable to the preservation of ruins, and after the city had once fallen into decay, all traces of it rapidly disappeared. Mindful of the great debt he owed the Greek mercenaries, Semtek little by little increased them. By this action he incensed the native mercenaries, who had hitherto ruled supreme in Egypt. According to Herodotus, two hundred and forty thousand men of the warriors who stood on the left of the king emigrated to Ethiopia in this reign, because they had not been relieved in their garrisons for three years. This story is assuredly untrue, but it reflects the fact that the native troops were highly dissatisfied and were no particular friends of Semtex. The stories that the Greek authors tell us of his scientific experiments to ascertain which people was the oldest of the world, and those that they relate of his efforts to find the source of the Nile, are all alike untrue and legendary. The remark of Strabo that he was one of the greatest conquerors of the world, is also false. The king was too much occupied with internal affairs to go in search of foreign conquest. The real fact of the matter is that Semtek was confined to Egypt proper. On the western frontier, he fortified Marea as a defense against Libya. On the Asiatic frontier, he erected the strong fortress of Daphne, near Pelusium, and on the Ethiopic frontier, the town of Suen, Aswan, Sayen, was strongly fortified. The fact that the three frontiers were thus put in a state of defense proves that the king did not make any conquests. Herodotus relates that he conquered Asdod after a siege of twenty-nine years, but there is no reason to believe this. The policy of this king and of all his successors was to gain the friendship of the Greeks. He gave lands along the banks of the Pelusian branch of the Nile, near Bubastis, to the Ionians and Carians, and in order that they might come into communication with his subjects, he gave them Egyptian boys whom they should teach Greek and who were to serve as interpreters. The Milesians soon after entered the Balbitic arm of the Nile and settled a fortified camp, which was called the Milesian camp. Tyrian merchants settled possibly about the same time in Memphis, and gave their name to the Tyrian quarter of the city. The king died about 610 B.C., having been prince of Sais and Memphis from 664 B.C., and king from 645 B.C. on. Section 2. Nekau Greek Neko and Nekau, 610 through 594 B.C. Nekau successfully continued the policy of his father. Herodotus relates that he began the construction of a canal which was to connect the Nile with the Red Sea, and that after a hundred and twenty thousand laborers had perished, Nekau suddenly stopped the work, having been warned by an oracle that he was working for the barbarians. This story is very improbable. A canal connecting the Nile with the Red Sea existed already in the times of Seti I and Ramses II, about seven hundred years before this time. This canal was mentioned in the Assyrian inscriptions of the 8th century B.C., 
and it is scarcely possible that it could have disappeared entirely in less than a century. Nikau possibly cleared it of sand and widened it. The story of the enormous number of laborers who perished during the progress of the work and that of the oracle are both utterly false. Herodotus relates a story of a great maritime enterprise undertaken at this time which seems quite credible. He states that Nekau sent out Phoenician ships from the Red Sea to circumnavigate Africa, and that in the third year of their journey they returned to the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar. The very fact that Herodotus questions, namely that in circumnavigating Libya, that is, Africa, they had the sun on their right hand, proves that they really did accomplish their task. The same historian relates that Nikau kept fleets of triremes in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Nikau felt himself strong enough to attempt the restoration of Egyptian supremacy in Asia. Great changes had meanwhile taken place on this continent. Asur Banapal died the king of a great empire, but his successors were not able to hold their own. About 608 B.C., Nabu Palasar, whom Asur Banapal had appointed viceroy of Babylon, threw off the Assyrian yoke and founded an independent Babylonian kingdom. Intent on crushing out the Assyrian kingdom, he allied himself with King Kyaxares of Medea, and together they attacked and completely annihilated the Assyrian kingdom. The Medes kept all the land east and north of the Tigris, the Babylonians, Mesopotamia, and Syria. Nekau thought the time had now come to intervene in Asia. Accordingly, in the spring of the year 608 B.C., he invaded the continent. He encountered no resistance until he reached Megiddo. Here, at the very spot where almost a thousand years before, Tutmosis III had defeated the Syrian coalition. King Josiah of Judah had drawn up his army, ready to dispute Nikau's advance. The pharaoh, not wishing to lose time in subduing the petty sovereigns of Syria and Palestine, haughtily ordered the Jewish king to give way. Josiah refused, and was arranging his army for the coming battle when he was fatally wounded by an arrow. The king was brought back to Jerusalem, where he died and was buried amid the wailings of his people, over whom he had ruled for thirty-nine years. Nekau continued his march to Ribla, near Hamath, where he went into camp. Meanwhile, the Jews had elected Joachas, the son of Josiah, king, but Nekau was dissatisfied with their choice, and deposed him, giving the kingdom to his older brother Joachim, and levying a heavy contribution on the land. Excepting Judea, Gaza was the only state that offered any resistance to the Egyptians. Up to the year 604 B.C., Nekau seems to have had his own way in Asia, but in that year Nabopolassar was ready to meet him. He himself was old and sick, so he sent his son, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian Nabu-Kuduri-Uzur, against the Egyptians. At Carchemish, on the banks of the Euphrates, the two armies met, and Nekau was utterly routed. His army must have been completely annihilated, for he left Syria to the victor without daring to oppose him again. 
Nebuchadnezzar probably had the intention of invading Egypt, but the death of his father compelled him to return to Babylon. Nikau did not dare to interfere in Asia again. Time and again, the Jews begged him for assistance in their repeated revolts against the Babylonians. At last, Jerusalem fell, about 596 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar was free to invade Egypt. But it seems that he was called to other parts of his kingdom, and the threatened invasion did not come until much later. Nekau died in 594 B.C., and was buried, like his father, in Sais. Section 3. Semtek II. 594 through 589 B.C. The only historical event of this short reign was an invasion of Ethiopia. Both Herodotus and Aristeus mention it, and an Egyptian inscription confirms their report. Late in this reign, General Neshor was sent against the Ethiopians, and the war was finally brought to a close early in the following reign. It may be that the trouble with Ethiopia had begun already in Nikau's time, and this would account for his otherwise incomprehensible policy with regard to the Jewish rebellions. The graffiti left on the Colossi of Abu Simbel by the Phoenician and Greek mercenaries that marched with the Egyptian army on this campaign still further confirm the report of Semtek's war in this quarter. Despite his short reign of only six years, this pharaoh was an active builder, restoring and repairing temples in all parts of Egypt, from the Delta to Nubia. Section 4. O Habre, Greek Apries, 589-564 through 564 B.C. Early in this reign, Neshor brought to a successful conclusion the Ethiopian War begun in the reign of Semtek II. Ouhabre thought matters in Asia favored an intervention on his part. In Judea, important changes had taken place in the times of his predecessors. Joachim, the king whom Nekau had appointed, was deposed in 597 B.C. after a reign of eleven years, and Joachim, his son, put in his place by Nebuchadnezzar. Soon after, he also was deposed, and Zedekiah put in his place. Zedekiah, 596 through 586 B.C., was not the man the Babylonian king had thought him. He determined, despite the warnings of the prophets, to win the independence of his kingdom. O Habre now came to his aid and began a war with Tyre. Sidon was taken, and a Cypriot fleet that opposed him was utterly defeated. Although thus far successful, the pharaoh withdrew soon after on the approach of the Babylonians. Meanwhile, Zedekiah had begun the war, but Jerusalem was soon invested, and, after a spirited resistance, was taken. July 587 B.C. While Ohabre did nothing to assist his sorely beset ally. Zedekiah was deposed and blinded, and Gedaliah was set on the throne. He was assassinated by a descendant of the family of Ishmael, who was soon after compelled to fly the country. He and his friends went to Egypt, where Ouahabre received them kindly. Soon after, 
Ouahabre began a war which promised better results. A war had broken out between the Greek city of Cyrene, which lay on the northern coast of Africa, west of Egypt, and the Libyans. The Libyan king, Adekram, placed himself under the protectorate of Egypt, and an Egyptian army was immediately sent out to aid him. At the town of Irsa, on the well of Thestis, a battle ensued, in which the Egyptian army was annihilated. This account, taken from Herodotus, is probably correct, but the rest of his account is certainly false. He relates that the Egyptians were furious over the defeat, and declared that Apries had sent out the native troops in order to have them annihilated, so that his rule over the rest of the Egyptians might be the more secure. This is entirely unnatural. In Egypt, the pharaoh was an absolute ruler. He was considered as the son of the god Ra and the incarnation of the god Horus, and it would not have been at all necessary for him to destroy the national troops in order to strengthen his rule. The troops, according to Herodotus, also murmured, and the king sent an officer named Amasis, Egyptian Achmes, to quiet them. While he was addressing them, a soldier, stepping behind him, placed a helmet on his head and proclaimed him king. The rest of the army shouted their assent, and Amasis, gladly accepting the election, placed himself at their head and marched against the pharaoh. A messenger sent by Apries was sent back with a sarcastic reply. Apries now prepared for battle, and collecting his Greek mercenaries to the number of thirty thousand, marched against his rival. At Mo Memphis, on the canopic branch of the Nile, the armies met, and Apries was, after a well-contested battle, defeated, captured, and brought to Memphis, where he was kept in prison for a while, but was finally delivered up to the angry populace and strangled. This story is utterly false from beginning to end, as are also the many anecdotes the Greek writers tell of Amasis. We know, however, that Ouahabre, about six years before his death, appointed Achmes II co-regent. Achmes was wedded to Anchnes Nefer Ab Ra, a daughter of Semtek II, and to Neit Akert, a sister of Ouahabre. These facts completely refute the Greek legends. Why Achmes was appointed co-regent, we cannot say. Possibly the king had no male issue, and wished to keep the succession in the family. In the time of their joint reign fell Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. This campaign was undertaken, according to the Babylonian inscriptions, in the thirty-seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, that is, in 567 B.C. The Babylonians found little or no resistance, and easily succeeded in overrunning and plundering the whole land as far as Aswan, and then retired either voluntarily or after having been defeated by Nes Hor. Be that as it may, the Babylonians never again entered Egypt. Oua Habre died in 564 B.C., after having ruled twenty-five years in all, nineteen alone, and six in conjunction with his brother-in-law and successor. Section 5. Achmes II. Amasis, 564 through 526 B.C. This pharaoh came into still closer connection with the Greeks than any of his predecessors. The many anecdotes the Greek authors tell 
of his private life and family relations are all untrustworthy, as are also the reports that Pythagoras, Solon, and Thales visited Egypt in his reign. Solon is even said to have copied from Amasis's laws one of the laws he promulgated at Athens in 594 B.C., a statement that is, of course, absurd. Further, this king is said to have entered into friendly relations with Cleobulus, Bias, and Pittacus, and to have foreseen the downfall of Polycrates. All of these stories, which are, by the by, chronologically impossible, have a direct tendency, namely, to prove that all of the knowledge and philosophy of Greece was derived from Egypt, Amasis being the king best known to the Greeks. They placed the Egyptian voyages of their sages in his reign. We have already alluded to these traditions in the introduction. More credible are the accounts the Greek writers give us of his wars. He fought against the Arabians, that is, the Asiatics, and in order to increase the valor of his troops, he had the statues of the chief divinities set up behind their ranks, so that the troops believed the gods themselves were observing them. He next sent out a fleet against Cyprus that succeeded in subduing the Cypriote cities, which remained Egyptian dependencies for some time thereafter. This expedition was most probably undertaken as part of Egypt's work in the great coalition which had been formed for the purpose of checking, if possible, the rise of the new Persian monarchy. This coalition was joined by Egypt, Lydia, Babylon, and Sparta. The object was to attack Persia from three sides at once, and, had the Allies acted in concert and not wasted valuable time over their preparations, they might have crushed Cyrus. As it was, Croesus moved before the others were ready, and all the help he could get from his allies consisted in a detachment of troops sent him by Achmes. In the spring of 546 B.C., he entered Cappadocia, devastated the country, and captured the strong fortress of Teria. Now was the time for Achmes and Nabu Naid, king of Babylon, to act, but it was impossible for them to concentrate their forces and to cooperate properly. Cyrus first moved against Croesus, and soon had conquered Lydia, taken its capital, and made the king a prisoner. Fall of 546 B.C. A Persian fleet sent against Cyprus easily succeeded in dislodging the Egyptian garrisons. Achmes now, instead of coming to the aid of his ally, Nabu Naid, remained inactive while the Persians conquered Babylon and took possession of Palestine and Syria as far as the Egyptian frontier. The pharaoh evidently hoped to pacify Cyrus by this inactivity, but he had gone just one step too far and had incurred the determined enmity of the Persians. That the invasion of Egypt did not follow immediately on the occupation of Palestine was owing to complications that had arisen on the eastern frontier. In the wars fought here, Cyrus lost his life, but his successor Cambyses soon punished Egypt for its share in the coalition against Persia. Achmes thought it to his advantage to interfere in Cyrene. Here, King Arcesilaus had been assassinated by Learchus, who had ascended the throne, and supported by Egyptian mercenaries, had instituted a most tyrannical rule. 
His misrule did not last long. He was assassinated at the instigation of Polyarchus and his sister, Erixo, who placed Battus, the son of Arcesilaus, on the throne. The Egyptian mercenaries now called on Achmes for aid, and he determined to take advantage of these conditions to subdue the city. Before he started on the expedition, however, his mother died, and he was detained in Egypt by the preparations for her interment. Polyarchus, accompanied by his mother Critola and his sister Erixo, now went to Egypt to propitiate the pharaoh. Achmes received them kindly, and praising the energy they had shown, dismissed them, loaded with presents. He now abandoned the expedition against Cyrene, as he was evidently satisfied with the recognition of his sovereignty. The two nations hereafter remained at peace until the downfall of Egypt. Achmes was confined entirely to Egypt. His expedition against Cyprus, though at first successful, had proved in the end a failure. In Asia, he dared not interfere. Ethiopia retained its independence, and his sovereignty over Cyrene was purely nominal. While the kingdom thus did not extend its boundaries under Achmes, still his reign was an epoch of great prosperity. Agriculture and commerce flourished, and it is stated that there were at this time 20,000 inhabited places in Egypt. The Greeks were, of course, greatly favored, and costly presents were made to their temples, among them being a contribution of a thousand pounds of alum, one of the most important raw products of Egypt, to the fund the Amphictyons were collecting for rebuilding the Delphic temple. Greek immigration was greatly encouraged. The Ionians and Carians, whom Semtek I had settled on the Pelusic branch of the Nile, were removed to Memphis to serve as a bodyguard to the pharaoh. In place of the harbor thus lost to the Greeks, the king gave them the city of Naucratus and its surroundings in the neighborhood of the present city of Alexandria. This new city stood outside of the pale of Egyptian jurisdiction and was allowed to make its own laws. The result was that the inhabitants clung to their own Greek customs and institutions with the greatest tenacity and went their way entirely uninfluenced by their Egyptian neighbors. The city being originally intended for Ionians from Teos, its government was modeled after that of the latter city. This town became the center of Greek activity in Egypt. In it, was erected the great sanctuary of the Greeks in Egypt. This was the Hellenion, which was built by several Greek cities conjointly. These cities were Chios, Teos, Phosei, Clazomene, Nidos, Halicarnassus, Phaselis, and Mytilene. The reason why so many cities helped to build the Hellenion was that all of the cities that took part in this work had the privilege of sending to Naucratus a supervisor of trade, or as we would put it, appointing a member of the board of trade. Temples to Zeus, Hera, and Apollo were also built by other cities who thus gained the same privilege as the builders of the Hellenion. Naucratis rose very rapidly, owing to certain laws that gave her a complete monopoly of the trade with Greece. The Greeks soon had colonies in all parts of Egypt, even in the southern portions of the country. The Milesians 
had a trading post at Abydos, and Samian merchants even settled in the great oasis. Being engaged in no great wars, this pharaoh was enabled to devote considerable attention to the temples of the land. In all parts of Egypt, from the delta to the island of Baige, we find traces of his work. He died 526 B.C., after having been co-regent of his brother-in-law for six years and sole ruler for thirty-eight years. Section 6. Semtek III and the Persian Conquest of Egypt, 526 to 525 B.C. When Semtek III ascended the throne of his fathers, the catastrophe that had so long threatened the land at length overwhelmed it. The account of this catastrophe has been preserved to us by Herodotus. The stories that, according to Greek traditions, impelled Cambyses to invade Egypt are all untrustworthy, as they seek to bring Cambyses into relationship with the Egyptian kings and to find the cause of the war in this relationship, while making Cambyses appear at the same time as the legitimate pharaoh. The war, far from having any such cause as the Greek historians would have us believe, had, in all probability, been determined on already by Cyrus, who was prevented from carrying out this part of his plan by other matters. Cambyses was free to attack Egypt, and he had ample cause for war in the fact that Egypt had been the ally of his father's worst enemies, King Croesus of Lydia and King Nabunaid of Babylon. Accordingly, Cambyses began making active preparations for the war, and everything indicated that he was going to have a hard time of it. The eastern frontier of Egypt was protected by the Syrian desert that skirted it, to cross, which was a task of no small difficulty. Recognizing this fact, Achmes had concentrated his forces at Pelusium, hoping to gain an easy victory over the Persian army, which no doubt would suffer terribly in the desert and reach the Egyptian border sadly used up. Cambyses did not underrate the difficulty of the undertaking and made the most extensive preparations. A great fleet was fitted out to attack Pelusium by sea, while the army attacked it by land. Just as he was about to start, he received unexpected and timely aid. In the Egyptian army, there was a Holocarnassian officer named Phanes, a bright and able leader, who had had some difficulty with Achmes. In consequence of this, he had fled to the Persian monarch. On the way, he was overtaken by the king's favorite eunuch, but managed to escape. Shortly after this event, Achmes had died, and Semtek III had succeeded him. Phanes not only betrayed to the Persians all the secrets of the state, but he also showed them the means of crossing the desert without great loss. To accomplish this, envoys were sent to all the Bedouin sheiks of the desert, and treaties were concluded with them. They agreed to furnish the army with camels and water, and thus the Persian army was enabled to cross the desert and to reach Pelusium with but little loss. The battle that ensued was waged with great fury, but finally, after both sides had lost heavily, the Persians were victorious, and the Egyptians fled from the field. Pelusium surrendered soon after. A ship was now sent to Memphis, whither the pharaoh had fled, to demand the city's surrender. 
when it entered the harbor of Memphis, the garrison boarded it, killed the crew, and destroyed the vessel. This breach of international usage met with a severe but well-merited punishment. Memphis was besieged and taken. Ten days after the capture, the punishment came. Two thousand sons of the most respected citizens, among them the son of King Semtek, were executed to atone for the death of the two hundred men that had composed the crew of the ill-fated vessel. The daughter of the pharaoh and the noblest virgins were sold into slavery, and the fortunes of the richest citizens and of the king's friends were confiscated, leaving their former owners beggars. The fate of Semtek was comparatively light, Cambyses even intending to make him governor of Egypt, but he became involved in a conspiracy against Cambyses and was compelled to take poison. Thus ended the last of the Semteks. As a result of the capture of Memphis, the Libyans submitted voluntarily and paid tribute. Cyrene and Barsea also sent tribute, but this the Persian monarch divided among his soldiers, as he hoped to gain far more by capturing these rich towns than he could ever get from them as voluntary tribute. End of chapter 9